Good day, brothers and sisters all over the Philippines, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, and in different parts of the world. It is the Lord's Day once again, and I hope that you're ready to praise and worship God as well as listen to God's Word. Now let me begin by quoting to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, which says, In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now the phrase which I would like to focus on here is that it says, This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Thanksgiving is the will of God for us. And I think that speaks a lot because the whole life of Jesus Christ was about the will of God. In the Garden of Gethsemane, what did he say? Not my will, but thy will be done. And then if you recall, he likewise said, my food is to do the will of the Father. And so the whole life of Jesus Christ is about the will of God and the will of the Father. And obviously, that should be true likewise with the followers of Jesus Christ. We should always be aligning ourselves with the will of God. And clearly, one of the things that is clear to us about the will of God is that we should be a thankful people. The Bible says, in everything, give thanks. When Pastor Edmund Chan was reading through the raw manuscript of my first book, Enough is Enough, he said that one of the things that he wanted to share to me about contentment is that contentment arises from gratitude. That is what he said to me. Contentment arises from gratitude or thanksgiving. And so when he said that, I thought to myself, well, it seems like I'm lacking a chapter here on thanksgiving. And so that's exactly what I did. I added a chapter on thanksgiving because thanksgiving indeed provides contentment. When you have a thankful heart, not a grumbling, complaining heart, when, you're, when you have a thankful heart, you're counting your blessings. You're not counting your trials. You're not counting your difficulties. You're counting your blessings. And when you're counting your blessings, that somehow produces in you a heart that breeds contentment. And that is why this is the will of God. The will of God for us is to have a thankful heart. And we can always express that in praise and in worship, singing the songs that give glory and praise to our God. So friends, why should we praise the Lord? Why should we rise from our seats? Why should we sing songs? Because it is the will of God for us. Shall we rise and let's worship the Lord at this time.
Son of God His only begotten one The Lion of Judah Prophesy Messiah Light of the world, the living word You are the Prince of Peace Emmanuel, God with us The fountain of living water and the bread of life Perfect sacrifice The great high priest Mediator a mercy seat Savior of the world of And who is and is to come The hope of glory The wisdom of a God and the coming King Your name is Jesus You reign forever and we worship you
praise be to Thee, wisdom, power, and thanks. All praise be to Thee, for Your love never fails. All praise be to Thee, the Here are our announcements. All our services are still suspended until further notice. We enjoin you to watch the coverage of our service every Sunday at 9 o'clock in the morning. Please visit our Facebook page, Living Word Christian Churches of Cebu International Incorporated, and our website, www.livingword.ph. You can also check out our YouTube channel to view all of our services and programs. Our sermon can also be heard over DYFR FM 98.7 on your dial every Saturday and Sunday at 8 p.m. Also, please check our Facebook page every day as we have lined up posts catering to our youth, our young adults, our couples, our worship lovers, the children's ministry, and others. More than enough can now be bought at our Living Word Center, Good Shepherd Road in Banawa. You can come here at our center every Tuesday and Thursday from 9 o'clock in the morning to 5 p.m. Also, you can come on a Friday at 9 o'clock in the morning up until 12 lunchtime. Please call us before you come. 
The number is 262-7455. By the way, we would like to remind you once again of the price of the book. It is 350 pesos, but if you buy in bulk, you can buy it at only 300 pesos per copy. So if you buy 10 copies or more, you'll be able to save up 50 pesos per copy. Buy now, brothers and sisters. We also have a new gospel Center discipleship material entitled Knowing Christ. It's available for only 150 pesos. Kindly text the number on your screen. Please do not also forget that we have an interactive midweek table talk every Wednesday live at 2 p.m. We have a series on the book of Revelation and right now we are talking about the tribulation period. Later on, we will likewise be talking about the rapture and the millennium. Please do not also forget our live intercession every Friday at 2 p.m. We would like you to join us in our prayers. There are a lot of things that we need to be praying for. So please join us every Friday at 2 p.m. We'd also like to thank our partners and those of our members who have been consistently giving to partner with us in the work of the Lord. We'd like to share our giving channels to those who would like to partner with us in the work of the Lord. You can deposit your love offerings to the following banks. Banco de Oro. Account name is LWCCCII. The account number is 001-000006080. We also have a BPI account. Account name is Living Word Christian Ministries, Cebu Incorporated. Account number is 10210234814. Finally, we have RCBC. Account name is LWCCCII. Account number is 1452005286. You may also send your love offerings and donations online through our website. Go to www.livingword.ph and click Give and then a dialog box comes out of it. Kindly click on your giving preferences. Thank you and God bless. The title of this sermon is The God of Desperate Times. Let us read Psalm 124. A song of ascents of David. Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, Had it not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. When their anger was kindled against us, then the waters would have engulfed us. The stream would have swept over our soul. Then the raging waters would have swept over our soul. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us to be torn by their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you, O God, that you watch over your people. And we know, Lord God, that even during these times, you're watching over us. Your faithfulness will follow us all the days of our lives. So we pray your blessing upon your word, O God, so that your name might be glorified and your people edified. I pray for myself, O God, that you might use me as an instrument, Lord, to communicate your truth that would bring inspiration to all of us, truth that would generate faith. Lord, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. As a Bible student, you and I become automatic uh, students of Israelite history. 
And one of the things that we have proudly observed is a kind of hatred that nations and people have towards the chosen people of God. I recall way back in the mid-1980s and maybe early 1990s, there was a lot of talk among Middle Eastern countries about wiping out the nation of Israel. And so we have so many stories like this. And of course, we just have to go back a few years, a few decades back, and we will remember the Nazi Holocaust. When you go to Israel, which we often do, we go to the Nazi, I'm sorry, with the Holocaust Museum. And there you will find many uh, shoes, shoes of people who had died, children, men, and women who died because of the firing squad. And of course, you have heard about the infamous gas chambers wherein many Israelites, many Israelis had died by the millions, by the thousands. And so when we observe Israelite history, this is one of the things that we see. We find anti-Semitism, which in other words is anti-Israelite uh, sentiment. And this is something that continues to go on. And as we talk about these things, I believe it should not be something that should overshadow the covenant faithfulness of God. So yes, we have seen anti-Semitism, anti-Israelite uh, sentiment, but we have seen so much more of God's covenant faithfulness wherein He has preserved God's people, He has del delivered God's chosen ones. And in terms of uh, application, I think this is also something that you and I see as well in our lives. We go through a lot of adversities, we go through a lot of trials, we go through a lot of difficulties, maybe even persecution and oppression. Yet one thing we have observed is the covenant faithfulness of God towards His people, towards His church. And we have seen His deliverance. We have seen God's faithfulness. This, I believe, is the central theme, the central study that I'd like to bring to the fore as we study this psalm. Now, let's go into a little outline as we see three main points. First of all, in verses 1 to 5, we find the declaration of the Lord's support and deliverance. In verses 1 to 2a, we find the declaration in this psalm. In verses 2b to 3a, we find the deliverance from opposition and physical harm. In verse 3b to verse 5, we find the deliverance from animosity and emotional meltdown. And then in verses 6 to 7, the devotion for God's deliverance. And finally, in verse 8, the divulgence of faith. So let's now dive into our study right now. And let's go to verses 1 to 5 as we talk about the declaration of the Lord's support and deliverance, and we find this in verses 1 to 2a, uh, the declaration of the psalmist. It says in verses 1 to 2, Had it not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, Had it not been the Lord who was on our side. Now, let's stop for a moment and let's do a little word study of the word Lord. What is the specific Hebrew word that is used here in the word Lord? It is the Hebrew word Yahweh. And coming from the Discovery Bible, here is a description or a definition of the word Yahweh. It says, God's personal name, Yahweh, then relays His eternal existence and self-existent life with the desire to give himself away to all seeking him. Now, I like what the late Gleason, Dr. Gleason Archer said about this name, and it's quite revealing. It goes, This Aramaic Hebrew root originally formed a third-person imperfect verb, meaning 
He is, was, and will be. Again, He is, was, and will be. The one who is and has always existed does exist and will always exist. This correlates the words of God to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, which says, I am who I am. So in terms of application to God's chosen people or the nation of Israel, what it simply means is this. God was on the side of Israel in the past. God in the present time is still on the side of Israel. And in the future, God will still be on the side of Israel. And for me, even just the name of Yahweh is, why, is quite comforting and quite encouraging. Why? Because it tells me that the Lord our God will be a great I am in the past, in the present, as well as in the future. In other words, this is a God in whom we can completely rely on, regardless of the timeline, regardless of the circumstance, regardless of whether we're talking about the past, the present, and the future. God is somebody we can always rely on. He will never forsake us. He will never abandon us. Now, David Jeremiah calls this God's eternal vigilance. I like that phrase, God's eternal vigilance. God will always be vigilant towards his people. His eyes will constantly be on us. His ears will constantly hear our prayers. And he will constantly reach out to us and minister to whatever needs you and I have. And again, this is something that has been displayed towards the nation of Israel. And you know, one of the things that I think should be brought to the fore is that God's covenant faithfulness to Israel remains up to today. There are some people who have this replacement theology and in their understanding, they believe that God is done with the nation of Israel. God will no longer pursue his people in the same way that he pursued them in the Old Testament. And so right now, as they say, the plan of God is merely for the church. And so it is the church that replaces the nation of Israel. So the big question I have for you right now, is that statement biblical? Is that really true? Is God done with the nation of Israel? Now, if you are thinking in those terms, I'd like to bring before you a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament which will debunk the replacement theology. And this is found in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 35. I'd like you to pay attention closely to these verses. It says, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who steers up the sea so that it waves, its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. Now watch verse 36. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. So here's the question I have for you. Do you steal the sun rising up in the morning? And do you see the sun setting down every evening? Do you see the moon and the stars every night? Is it still something that is true up to today? Now that is the fixed order of God. And God is saying something very powerful here, something that I believe 
those who have replacement theology should take a look at because that will debunk their understanding that God is done with the nation of Israel. May I repeat verse 36 once again. It says, If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then the offspring of Israel also will cease from being a nation before me forever. In other words, if the sun no longer, uh, if the sun is no longer rising up from the east, if the sun is no longer setting down during, uh, during the uh, nighttime or during uh, the afternoon, then that means that God is done with the nation of Israel. But this fixed order remains. And therefore, God, God's covenant faithfulness, God's hesed, continues on with this nation. In Romans chapter 11, verse 1 in the New Testament, this is what Paul has to say. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And then in Romans chapter 11, verse 28, it says, From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Now, I'd like to point out, before I continue reading that verse, the fact that it says here, they are beloved for the sake of their fathers. In other words, the reason why God will continue with his covenant faithfulness with this nation is because of the covenant that he had made with Abraham, which is a covenant which could never be broken. And likewise, he made a covenant with David. Once again, a covenant which could not be broken. Both covenants are unconditional covenants. And the reason why God will continue to preserve his people, the reason why God will continue to minister to his people, is because he will continually remember his promise to Abraham and to David. God will never renege on his promise to Abraham and to David. And because of that, we know that God's continuing loving kindness will prevail upon that nation. And that is confirmed in the following verse in Romans 11, verse 29. It says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now remember, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable is applied to the nation of Israel. I've heard many people use this verse of scripture in relation to their own ministry, in relation to, for example, to uh, the work of God towards his church. And I, I see so many applications in relation to this verse. And again, um, I believe that uh, that is fine, that's all right. You can make application on other things which have the same nature or have the same essence. But let us not forget the fact that this was primarily applied to the nation of Israel. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Again, irrevocable. That is why the plans of God for the nation of Israel continue on. His promises towards that nation would be fulfilled. That is why the phrase, let Israel now say, is quite telling because it is in the imperfect tense in Hebrew, which speaks of continuing activity and is therefore omnitemporal. Now, what do we mean by omnitemporal? It means that it includes the time frame of the past, the present, as well as the future. This was something that Israel was 
to continually do. They were to continually say that God will be faithful to them. And so, once again, it says, let Israel now say. Now, the word now is a translation of the Hebrew na, which denotes an emotional intensification, which underlines the urgency of the request and means now, oh please, let Israel now say. There is a sense of, of urgency. This is a request that is being made by the psalmist. Now we find in verses 2b to verse 3a, the deliverance from opposition and physical harm. It says, when men rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us alive. Now the Ellicott commentary states, swallowed or quick alive, or quick or which could be translated as alive, is no doubt an allusion to the fall of Korah, which is found in Numbers 16, 32 to 33, where the same verb and adjective occur together. In number 16, uh, verse 28, allow me to read this. It says, Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer the fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that is theirs and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand that these men have spurned the Lord. As he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up and their households and all the men who belonged to Korah with their possessions. So they, they and all that belonged to them went down alive to Sheol, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. So that is the same thought here. The psalmist was saying that had the Lord not been on our side, would we would have been swallowed up just like Korah, just like these rebels, that would have happened to us. And by the way, the word swallowed here is in the perfect tense, which speaks of completed action. The point being that without God's intervention, destruction would have been a foregone conclusion. It would have been a foregone conclusion. The word alive, by the way, is also quite interesting because it is also, it is likewise a contrast emphasis in Hebrew, which intensifies what could have happened to them. This speaks about Israel's utter ruin in the face of the onslaught of their enemies. So in other words, they were up against not only difficult odds, they were up against impossible odds. It would have been absolutely impossible for them to have been delivered if not for the hand of God upon them. And once again, this is something that the nation of Israel has experienced over and over again. Many attempts have been made to wipe out this nation, to wipe out this people, to no avail. Why? Because God is watching over these people to survive and to be preserved. And that is why up until today, there is a nation of Israel. Up until today, they have survived. Up until today, they continue to thrive and even progress. To what can we attribute this? Not the hand of man. Not the genius of the Israelis, but we attribute this to the hand of God. The God who made a promise to Abraham. The God who made a promise to David. And he is fulfilling his promise to them. And that is why Israel should be grateful to the God of Abraham. They should be grateful to Yahweh. 
because it is Yahweh who has preserved them all through these years and will continue to do so. Now, in terms of application, as God's people today, the church, for us believers, have we seen the same thing? Have we seen the preservation of God? Have we seen the deliverance of God in our lives? And if we are to believe Paul, Paul said that many are the afflictions, that he had gone through many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered Paul out of them all. And the same thing is true in our case. And that brings me back to certain memories. Uh, I would have been a widower today if you have not yet read uh, my book, More Than Enough, I laid out a story there wherein my wife had a near-death experience. And if not for the deliverance of God, if not for the miracle of God, I would be a widower today. And the same thing would be true in the case of my son. My son, I would have lost my son. He likewise had a near-death experience when he was five years old. Again, the story is found in the book, More Than Enough. I would have lost them if not for the hand of God, if not for the miracle of God, if not for the grace of God, if not for the preservation and the salvation that God has wrought through those individuals, those loved individuals in my life. I would have lost them. But you know, it, it would have even been a greater loss as well to the church. Why? Because my wife right now, most especially in this pandemic crisis, has been discipling a lot of women. She has been edifying and building the faith of a lot of women. And not only that, of late, the Lord has been using her to compose certain songs. I mean... Very wonderful songs, gospel songs, songs that would truly remind us of our salvation in Jesus Christ. And right now, my son is likewise being used as my associate uh, pastor, and he has been helping me out tremendously in so many ways, technically, um, even in the area of uh, managing uh, many of the uh, uh, virtual uh, programs that I have, the, the live intercession, the midweek table talk, but that is not all. He himself has his own ministries and the Lord has, has used him powerfully in his vlogs. The Lord has used him in a lot of speaking engagements. The, the church would have been, would have lost a lot if God had not intervened. And that is why, what do I see? I see a God of faithfulness. A God who has been so kind in preserving my loved ones. A God who has been so caring. And that, I believe, is likewise true in your own lives. Now, in verses 3b to verse 5, we find deliverance from animosity and an emotional meltdown. It says, when their anger was kindled against us, then the waters would have engulfed us. The stream would have swept over our soul. Then the raging waters would have swept over our soul. Now, again, um, in our study of the scriptures, uh, in my study in the Expositors Academy, one of the things that my professors pointed out is that you need to study the pronouns as well. And sometimes this is something that we neglect in a surface reading. We don't really notice the importance of pronouns. But you see, pronouns are very important. And the pronoun that I believe, the possessive pronoun I believe that needs to be studied in this uh, verse of scripture that I just read to you is the word us. Now, what is so important about the word us here? The word us here in the Hebrew is a contrast emphasis, which means they, the nation of Israel, they would have suffered and others would not be affected. Again, the point of the psalmist is this, they would be affected 
but others would not. This probably speaks of the anti-Semitism of nations that hate Israel to the extent of wanting to destroy or exterminate it. So the point really of the psalmist here is God's care upon the nation of Israel. God's covenant faithfulness upon the nation of Israel in spite of the opposition that they were going through. Now the word engulfed and swept here are in the perfect tense, by the way which speaks of completed action, the point being that without God's intervention, an emotional or mental collapse would have happened with the nation of Israel. It would have been a foregone conclusion. And again, uh, just to share and relate to you uh, an experience that I had, which I again uh, shared in my book more than enough, um, for seven long years, I had panic attacks. And in my testimony, I did get to share that in those seven years, I forgot the meaning of the word happiness. I mean, I understood what it meant from the Webster's Dictionary or from uh, another dictionary. But in so far as the experience of it is concerned, in so far as a vicarious experience of happiness was concerned, I forgot the meaning of the word happiness. And the same thing would have happened to me. The same thing that the psalmist was saying. An emotional ment mental collapse, an emotional mental meltdown would have happened to me. And I would have been lost. I would not be preaching to you today. I would not have written those two books that I have written so far. Enough is enough and more than enough. And the only reason I am standing here right now and speaking and communicating to you is because of the manifold grace of God. This was the experience of the psalmist. And, and that is why I take pains in, in trying to point out to you the emotional tone the nuances of the Hebrew, so that you and I could feel what the psalmist was feeling. He was feeling so grateful for the deliverance of God. He was feeling, you know, he was feeling very edified and very much inspired with what God had done for the nation of Israel. And we should be inspired likewise with what God has done in our case. Now, the word swept, by the way, is a contrast emphasis in Hebrew, which intensifies what could have happened to them. Things could have been far worse than what they had perceived would have happened to them. And again, we see here the depths of gratitude, the depth of praise that the psalmist had. And one of the things I'd like to ask you is, is this, do, do you still have that depth of gratitude towards God? That depth of, of thanksgiving, wherein you consecrate your entire life to God, you rededicate your entire life to God, you, you somehow surrender everything to Him. You throw away all the idols of your life. God is seated on the throne of your heart. Because this is what I see in the psalmist's heart. A heart of gratitude. An indebtedness towards the love and the care of God towards that nation and towards the psalmist himself. And I pray that that is the same thing you and I are feeling. You know, one of the things that scares me during this pandemic crisis, even as we're going through virtual services, one of the things I ask God is whether the passion of the people remain, whether their hearts are still clinging on towards God, whether people are still steadfast and faithful to the Lord, or is it possible that people are right now backsliding in their hearts? That is one of the things that scares me. 
with what is possibly happening with our own church. And I pray that that is not true. And I pray that as we study this psalm, our, our passion, our desire for God would somehow be rekindled and be refreshed, that it might be reinvigorated so that our relationship with God would be fresh, it would be intimate, it would be special. That is something that I desire. Now, in verses 6 to 7, we find devotion for God's deliverance. It says, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us to be torn by their teeth. Our soul has escaped as a bird out of the snare of the trapper. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Now, when we examine the word blessed here, what comes into your mind? Perhaps what comes into your mind is a casual thanksgiving, a casual acknowledgement of the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the deliverance of God. But it's merely casual. And a, a word study of the word blessed here will change your mind. This is not a casual thanksgiving. This is not a casual acknowledgement of what God has done. The word blessed here is the Hebrew word barak, a primitive root which means to kneel as when blessed by adoring on bended knees. Blessing God, in this case, is the act of the believer giving themselves away, willingly conferring themselves to God in complete consecration. So this is not a mere acknowledgement. This is not mere thanksgiving. But because of the greatness of God's deliverance, because of the depth of gratitude that the psalmist felt, he was consecrating himself to God. He was adoring God on bended knees. He was dedicating his entire life to God. Isn't that what happened you, when you first became a Christian? When you received the Lord Jesus Christ? Your heart was so on fire. You were so passionate that you were willing to go anywhere to serve God. You are willing to go through anything and everything in your love towards God. That is, that is how you felt in your honeymoon stage with the Lord. And, and that is exactly what the psalmist was, was feeling when he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. It was not a mere acknowledgement. It was not mere thanksgiving. It was surrender. It was consecration. It was dedication of one's life. And friends, that is what I would like to ask you at this time. Or if the Lord would examine our hearts, would He say the same thing as He said to the Ephesian church in the book of Revelation when He said, But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. I pray that is not true. So th there is a contrast here with the word blessed and to merely praise God, which focuses on thankful acknowledgement, exalting what is right and deserves praise. This is so much more than that. That's the word blessed here. Now, continuing on, the word given here, as in the phrase, who has not given us to be torn by their teeth, is in the perfect tense, which speaks of completed action. Meaning to say that without God's intervention, their ruin would have been inevitable. And again, recounting the history of Israel, that has always been the case. They would have been ruined, they would have been exterminated, if not for the hand of God. You recall the story of Esther, you recall the story of, of Haman, how he decided to destroy Mordecai and all the rest of the Jews. If God had not intervened, there would have been no nation of Israel. And the problem would have been not only that there would be no nation of Israel, there would be no Messiah. There would be no Savior. There would be no salvation. 
You and I would not have this dialogue. We would not even have this discussion at all. Why? Because if that had happened, there's nothing to talk about. There is no atonement to talk about. That is why what this psalmist is saying is something that should truly bless our hearts. Now again, that is the same with the word escape. The word escape here is in the perfect tense, which again speaks of completed action. If not for God's intervention, once again, they would have been trapped. There would have been nowhere to go. They were pinned to a corner. And so many times, isn't that how we feel? Most especially, perhaps, during this pandemic crisis. We're like being pinned to a corner. And, and we can't see the future quite clearly. Somehow, uh, it's blurry. Somehow, it's still fussy. But somehow, you know, you and I know that because God keeps His covenant with His people, because God is faithful, because God will not abandon us, we simply need to hold His hand and He will carry us through. He will make us ride through ego's wings so that we might be able to soar, soar over and above the storm that you and I are facing. Now, interestingly, the word we hear in Hebrew is a focus emphasis. Now, why is that so important? Again, we're, we're looking at the pronoun here, which basically means we, the nation of Israel. We, the nation of Israel, which implies God's intentional and personal protection of His covenant people. God's intentional and personal protection of His covenant people. And so we go to our final point, the divulgence of faith in verse 8, which says, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and earth. Now once again, let's do a little word study here. The word help, I think, is very important here. It's the word ezer. Now, let me ask you this question. Does that Hebrew word sound familiar to you? Well, it sounds familiar to me, most especially because uh, several years ago, way back, perhaps in the late 1980s, I went to one of the uh, well-known seminaries in our country, actually a Bible uh, seminary among the Alliance people, Ebenezer, uh, Bible Institute in Zamboanga. And so that word, Ezer, is quite uh, familiar to me. And that is why when, when somebody says Ezer or Ebenezer, you know, it, it's quite familiar to me. And so where do we find this in scriptures? I'd like to bring you back to 1 Samuel chapter 7, beginning at verse 10. And it says, Now Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, and the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day against the Philistines and confused them so that they were routed before Israel. The men of Israel went out of Mizpah, and pursued the Philistines and struck them down as far as below beth -car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. Thus far the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and they did not come any more within the border of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. Again, the word Ebenezer means, thus far the Lord has helped us. And you know, going through um, memory lane and just uh, trying to refresh and reminisce uh, some of the memories in my 36 year journey with God, I can say the same thing, Ebenezer. Thus far, God has helped me. Thus far, God has helped me. 
I've been through a lot of challenges, a lot of trials, a lot of difficulties, a lot of adversities. In fact, sometimes I get to ask God, Lord, why is it that my journey with you has been filled with a lot of afflictions, a lot of adversities, a lot of difficulties? I just realized in hindsight that all of these things were really a preparation for God to achieve certain purposes in my life. And that is somehow to declare the victories that God has given to me all through these years. You see, without those problems, without those difficulties, without those adversities that you and I have gone through, we will have no stories to tell. We will always have this ho-hum attitude towards our own lives because, again, it's going to be very boring because there's no excitement, there's no adventure, there are no valleys. Uh, I mean, can you just imagine if the whole world that we are living in is just one entire plane, all right? Everything is flat. It would be boring, right? But you know what makes, uh, you know, earth beautiful is the valleys, the mountains, um, the plain land. All of these things combined make a beautiful tapestry um, that, that relates to us, the beauty of God's power in creation. And somehow, that is how I see my life, most especially right now. Even as I've written uh, those two books, uh, Enough is Enough and More Than Enough, that is how I see things right now. Things would have been boring for me. Things would have been monotonous for me. And I would not have had a personal revelation of who God is in my life. But right now, I can say, because of all the experiences that I've had in my life, that God is my healer, that God is my deliverer, God is my provider, God is my sustainer, God is my savior, God is my delight, God is my strength. God is the God who works out His purposes in my life. God is the God who watches over me. And I can say that from the bottom of my heart. It's not something I got from a textbook. It's not something that I got from a theological book. I mean, I do not need a theological book for me to be able to, to communicate and say that God is omnipresent. I do not need a theological book to say that God is omniscient. I do not need a theological book to say that God is omnipotent. I can say that and maybe I, I may not be able to share all those fancy words, but deep down in my heart, I know that to be true. Why? Because I have experienced that in my own life. And I think that is very important. If you and I are going to be convincing, most especially to unbelievers, most especially to those we, we are sharing the gospel to, it has got to come from the bottom of our hearts. It must not just be something that we lifted from a page of a book, but something that we have personally experienced in our own lives. And when we communicate, people will know that it's genuine. People will know that it's real. Why? Because we can't fake it. The emotional tone is something that we cannot fake. I mean, we can, we can come up with all sorts of theatrics and uh, be an orator. And yet that will not have any effect whatsoever in people's hearts. I recall George Whitfield, a man who was mightily used of God. And there was one man who happened to be an unbeliever, but wanted to listen to George Whitfield. 
And, and guess what? What he just wanted to hear. He just wanted George Whitfield to say, Oh God. Because he said, when he says, Oh God, it is so different when other people say, Oh God. Where lies the difference? The difference lies in the experience. And I recall one um, person who was um, listening to an audition of a singer. And the singer sang very beautifully, very beautifully. I mean, technically, there was absolutely nothing wrong with the song nor with the singer. But the one who was uh, making that audition or the one who was evaluating that audition said, there's one thing that is lacking. I do not feel your song. I do not feel your song. And if my memory serves me right, the one who was doing this evaluation said, you have to be broken for you to be able to sing that song with conviction. I recall likewise, the story of an orator who, um, who shared Psalm 23. And, and again, uh, the diction was perfect. Um, the, the timing was perfect. I mean, the, uh, the ups and downs of, of the voice were perfect. But it was different when somebody else, somebody who saw God as the shepherd of his life, recited Psalm 23. It was so much more convincing. And you know, in my study of, of this psalm, I felt the heart of the psalmist. I felt the depth of his gratitude. I felt the the, the revelation, the, the, the revelation that, that he was sharing here was something that was real, something that was genuine. Why? Because he experienced it. And this is something that, that needs to happen. Is your relationship with God genuine? Is there real intimacy and real communion with God? Is there depth of consecration and dedication? Because that is what makes the difference. And that is why here in this psalm, reading once again, when, when in verse 8, when the psalmist said, Our help is in the name of the Lord who made the heaven and earth. The psalmist was making known. This is what divulgence means. Where, where his faith lies. His faith lies in the Lord who is creator of all. And I think it's quite interesting that, he states here, our help is the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So the big question is, why? why does he use or why does he reference God as a creator? Because the psalmist knew, based on the book of Genesis, that God created the world out of nothing. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. And if God could do something, as magnificent and as great and as majestic as the whole of creation, he can definitely do the things, uh, he can definitely bring about and accomplish great deliverance and great preservation in our own lives. This is what the psalmist wanted to declare before the people. God can do all these things. Nothing is difficult with him. Nothing is impossible with him. If he could do something as great as creation, he can do something which is even smaller. Uh, he can do something great in something that is smaller in comparison to creation. So let me just conclude by saying, it is amazing to know that after 2,000 years, Counting 
uh, from 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed. It is amazing that the nation of Israel is back in its own land, in its own country. It has recaptured its own culture, its own customs. It has recaptured the Hebrew language and it has recaptured even its own destiny, its own understanding of the Abrahamic covenant as well as the Davidic covenant. Of course, there is still so much work to be done with that nation because they have failed to see the whole point of the history of that nation, which is the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is yet to be seen in that nation and it will happen. But again, I focus on the fact that the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. There are a million reasons why Israel should no longer be in existence. But they are still existing as a nation. And that to me is quite comforting. Because God, that tells me that God will keep his promises to his people. God will keep his promises to his people. He will preserve us and deliver us from this time on and forever. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and bless you, Lord, for our time together. Thank you for this study. And we pray, O oh God, that you might somehow inspire and and let faith spring up in the hearts and in the minds of your people. Lord, let your name be glorified. Let your name be exalted and be praised. Lord, we thank you for today. In Jesus' blessed name we pray. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. It was a great Sunday morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you for tuning in with us. And please uh, uh, do not forget, uh, right after this, uh, we will have a video endorsement. But for now, my wife and my son would like to say hi and goodbye to you as well. God bless you all. Please tune in. Hi! So why another book in conquering or overcoming sufferings as a believer when we have literally a lot out there? Well, first, the timing. If we're all in a global crisis where sufferings are and will obviously take or is taking its toll everywhere and we need a lot of help in terms of discovering or rediscovering truth perspectives. Treating truths not just theologically, thus more likely theoretically, but also in all its practicality, of which I find this book excellent because it's laden with Brother Mel's personal own experience of suffering, some of which have I personally witnessed having known him since I was a teenager. He also included generously the experiences of others personally known to him to reinforce further his point in how he and they conquered those difficulties and challenges by God's grace through prayer, patience, and praise. Second, the timelessness of biblical truths behooves us all to turn to it as our ultimate guide in facing and overcoming sufferings which are integral part of our fallen humanity. Thus, they will not go away, and we should not just ignore them all the way. In this respect, more than enough will be a great blessing to its readers because it dealt with the subject appropriately and proportionately. Grab a copy now.